Okay, Jeff Lock of June, recorded in July, because I'm only now done with uh, university exams, which thankfully is the final theoretical exams I have to do ever. Next year is my last year, and then it's just practical stuff and, and a final internship. And practical stuff and internships are easy. That's just like no problem. It's the theoretical stuff that I fucking hate. So that's no longer going to get in the way, thankfully. That's that. Now, finally, back to the game, which unfortunately I have forgotten most of what I did because I've not been able to work on this for almost three weeks. Okay, one thing I have been doing. Let's just show something fun first. Something that I have been doing is... Uh, enemies can now follow you al across gaps. So he, he, he will jump after me and set me on fire. What a dickhead. Alright. So, I mean, that's fixed. It's... The way it works, it's it basically checks if there is a direct navigation line between me and the target. If there's not a direct navigation line, that means that uh, the, the AI cannot reach me. So the AI will attempt to perform a jump if they can do it. So it needs to be within a certain distance. It needs to be within a, cer within a certain angle, which has been... Is this something that I've been triggered, uh, have tried to figure out for a very long time? That's how to get a good jumping angle. Because it's it's a lot of uh, trigonometry calculations that for some reason I always just fail to do correctly. But I finally able to find a way to calculate how to get a correct jumping ang angle for the AI. Now, what do I mean with a correct jumping angle? And hopefully he doesn't kill me. Um, when I want the AI to jump after me, there are two things I don't want the AI to do. I don't want the AI to make a jump that is too shallow. Because if the jump angle is too shallow, it's very likely that the AI will hit an, will hit an edge or hit an object and basically get stuck. And that's obviously something I don't want. Uh, if the jumping angle is too high, it's going to either hit its head on the roof and it's also possibly going to take way too long for him to land again. So it will be like a huge jump to only cover a small distance. So the minimum jump uh, jump angle is 30 degrees and the maximum jump. And uh, what it does, it, it tries to find the minimum uh, jump angle that is still higher than 30 degrees jumping. Which, that sounds easy, but it was actually pretty difficult to calculate. But eventually I did it. So that's not the only... So, when I got that working... Hey, he used the door. Amazing. Um, when I got that working, I immediately... There was another problem I had, which is that the AI will take a very long route. Even if they could just, like, jump a small gap. So I thought, like, hey, maybe I could... Uh, instead of also uh, calculating uh, if there is a direct line to me, I could also calculate is the direct line, is the navigation line, is the length of it, God damn it, is the length of it much longer than a jump would be? And if that's the case, then the AI will just jump the gap instead of going all the way around it. So I can show that here with these two crevices, ravines, whatever. So if I go here, instead of going all the way around, the AI will uh, chase me. Now, there are some limitations to this jumping thing. The AI will always jump directly at me. That's because it takes my position in order to calculate the jump angle. What I'm thinking I could also do is leave markers behind. So my character could leave markers behind. So even if my character were to go out of sight of the AI and the AI still needs to perform the jump, what would happen right now is the AI would basically just get stuck. Now that would take a very specific type of level design for that problem to occur, but it could occur. But for now, this is fine. Also right now there is no jumping animation and I'll get to that later. So yeah. All melee enemies can now 
jump. Ranged enemies don't bother because they're ranged. So, whatever. Uh, okay. Jumping mobs, hitbox stuff. Oh yeah, this is something I had last month done, but it's worth talking about now because I forgot. Uh, I need to go to my meshes, my demon. Yes. A warrior, no. I'm trying to think, demon skeleton. And then go to my. Where is it? I'm trying to find my physics asset. Oh, there it is. Yes, there we go. So I have changed the hitboxes from capsules to boxes. Uh, this is for one reason, but I actually found a second reason to do this. And both of those are amazing reasons to use boxes instead of capsules. If you want to see what the capsule is. Uh, Yeah, a capsule is basically just a pill. It's just a cylinder. The reason why you, technically speaking, you want to use capsules is because capsules are better. Uh, they 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 fit the model better. The problem with capsules is, first of all, it takes more. It takes way more performance. I don't know how much exactly. Like I don't know, probably like three or four times more computing power to calculate a capsule which that sounds like a lot but modern computers can calculate uh, hitboxes really quickly but the thing is i just want the most amounts of performance and i had about what well, like oh, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself this is something i noticed in my previous uh, devlogs i have a tendency to start talking about stuff before i even explained what i'm talking about and my head basically goes faster than i'm talking and it sometimes causes me to, it makes it so people just can't follow me. So that's, uh, I go way too fast with my head. <sighs> okay, the, the reason is, I'm not going to explain it. The reason is boxes are more efficient in the performance. And if I get, have a lot of enemies, I want to get as much performance as possible. And that's why I want to use boxes, period, point. Um, another reason to use boxes instead of capsules is something I figured out during testing, and that is the uh, physics are way more reliable. So, okay, he's a little bit twitchy, but not very twitchy. With capsules, the uh, enemy bodies were very, very twitchy. And that actually, was actually a problem that I had on my list on fixing, but now that I switched to uh, boxes, it has been fixed. And the reason why it has been fixed is, well, I thought about it myself. Like, why is this the case? Well, it, the answer is really easy. Take a, take a cube. Take a cube. Take a cube and you throw the cube on the floor. How long will it take for the cube to stop moving? Now take a, uh, a sphere and throw that on the ground. How long does it take for the sphere to stop moving? Well, it's going to take a very long time unless it gets stuck on something. And that's the exact same case with hitboxes. The reason why... Uh, box collision uh, is less twitchy is because it's just it can find equilibrium way faster than a sphere so yeah he just turned into a static corpse that's fine we all do eventually um what's next da, 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 da. Save data, okay. So that's another major thing that I still need to do, and that is being able to save the game. Again, that's something that sounds easy, but it's actually very tedious to do. So, I want to get a classic save system. So most modern games use a, I want to say most modern games, but most modern games are open world, which actually don't no longer works with that system. But most uh, modern games use checkpoint systems. So instead of having to save every single object in the game, it just saves uh, to the checkpoint. And from that checkpoint, it knows what to spawn. 
I want a classic save system that just saves everything. So you can just quick save and quick load at any time. Because that's, I mean, it's a retro FPS. Retro FPS are expected to have a save system like that. So at first I thought like, oh, could I, couldn't I just take the entire state of the game and save it? No, that's not possible. Because you can't save uh, objects. You can't save objects. The reason why you can't save objects is objects have always have some kind of reference in them and you can't save references. The reason why you can't save references is because references are uh, pointers to memory. And you can't save your location in memory because next time you're going to start the game, your memory location is going to be different. So that's obviously not going to work. Technically speaking, if this was MS-DOS or some really old operating system, you could probably get away with it by literally saving the entire game in its memory location because back then memory allocation was something you really had a lot of control over. But with modern OSs, yeah, better. No, that's not going to work. So what I need to do... So since I'm not allowed to save references, I need to just make a massive array of structs. So I'm just going to quickly find my save status interface. This is the header. Okay, header. So in here, F saved object struct. In here, I need to save all of the information uh, of all of my different game objects. So I only need to save the data of uh, objects that um, can have different states or which unfortunately is most objects but something like something like a wall would not have I would not have to save a wall because the wall is static the wall doesn't move if everything goes right in here at least um, and the wall also doesn't have a state it just has one state it's a wall that's that's all it is so I don't have to save that because every time when I load the level, I know that the wall is going to be in the same place. An enemy, however, or a door can have different states. So if I go through the door, the door is open. If I now save the game and then load the game back up, the, the door still should be open. I should also remember whether it's locked or not, etc., etc., etc. Now, that's going to cause problems because... Most of my objects right now are exclusively in uh, blueprints. And my save system is in C++ because, I mean, everything that I now make new, new, I do in C++. Everything I make new, I do in C++. I don't do anything in blueprints anymore. The only thing that are still in blueprints are just stuff that I made before I started doing C++. And I explained this. But I'm going to explain it again. I'm grabbing my tablet. Hey, uh. So, um, let's get a quick one. No. Why is it doing that? I want full opacity. Oh, I'm just on. There we go. Actually, I'm just going to use the square tool. Oh, it also did reset. Okay, whatever. So. This is the three layers of Unreal. So this would be the engine layer. So this would be uh, UE. So this would, oh, I'm still on squares. Where is my cursor? There. So this would be UE, Unreal. Unreal Engine, that's basically the base layer. Then in the middle, I would have my, uh, gonna do game. C++. So then I have my game C++ layer. All the way up top, I have my 
game, so my own game, uh, BP blueprints. So I can only look down in uh, my game CVP. So my game CVP layer can only get stuff from either Unreal or from uh, classes within game CVP as long as I give a, a header file for whatever I'm trying to call. My blueprints game can only find stuff that's in the C++ layer. So CP, CPP, yeah, C++. Uh, C++ cannot look up. So I can't uh, see anything that's in the blueprint layer. Why is this a problem in my save data? I have a lot of uh, stuff in my uh, blueprint layer. My game since my save system is in my game CVP, I can't get uh, objects that are currently in my blueprint layer. So doors, for example, were in my blueprint layer, and I couldn't get to them. So if I wanted to save doors, I would first have to make a class in C++ and then bind it to blueprints. But that's not just that. I also need to the variables I want to save should also be in uh c++ so if i go to my c++ and go to my door my sk door here it has all of my uh what's it called variables that need to be saved so there are some variables that would need to be saved so uh be locked status that's a that's a variable thing that needs to be saved that's whether the door is locked B is open, that's something that needs to be saved. B is not accessible, that's also something that needs to be saved. If you want to know what's inaccessible, it's inaccessible just means that the door under no circumstances can open. So that basically that basically means that the door is disabled and it also means that it's not trying to do query checks. It's just a performance thing. Uh, door open angle offsets should not be saved because that's uh, saved by the blueprint itself. So every door will have its own uh, Offset angle for, sorry, offset for how far it will open. Uh, current open offset needs to be saved because that's how far the door is currently open. Door open time is something that I don't have to save because that's just how fast the door open and closes. And that's something that is always the same for every door. So that should not be saved. Keycard type is something that would need to be saved because that's something that would differ from door to door. That's just a thing. So the way my save system works is I have a save status interface. And in my save status interface, I have my save struct. So in this struct, I would put every variable that needs to be saved, like I just said. Okay, there was, there was a little bit of a problem, but I'm, honestly, I'm not gonna explain it. It's gonna take too long. But I have to save everything in one struct. So this would be one giant struct, which isn't, not very memory efficient, but since this structs get deleted anyway, after the game is loaded, it's fine. And I'm not going to explain why, because it, it would take too long. Then I have my saved object structs, so that this would be saved in the save file. Then here, I have my write save status, set saved data, and resource saved references. Oh yeah, that's also another thing. So trying to think so one class that i already have added to my save system is pawn so if i go to my pawn class in my uh, class you will see that there is a multi-inheritance for saved status interface which is an abstract class of course and in my abstract class i will i will get my functions which i've put here so write save data. So these are these are the same functions that were in save status interface. So here, here there are abstracts, and here I'm actually defining what they do. So if I go to write save status, I pick the definition. Here, all of my variables that need to be saved are saved. So my weapons are saved, my uh, location, health, armor, whatever, all of that is saved in this uh, struct. And then when I'm loading my data, it 
uh, loads everything. Now this looks like quite a lot. That's just simply because this is the pawn class and that's by far the, the heaviest class to save. Most other classes are only going to have like two or three or maybe four variables. So it's going to look a lot better. And then there is also restored saved references. So what restored saved references does is, like I said earlier, you can't save references. And sometimes you have references to other objects by your objects. So in the case of a pawn, uh, pawns in my game can have a, uh, what is it? Uh, they can have a a trigger, yeah, a trigger. It's it's triggered. Um, they can have a bound trigger, and uh, that's just so basically a door. I could bind the door opening mechanism to a pawn, and when the pawn gets killed, the door automatically unlocks. That's that's basically it. So that would be a bound trigger, and that would be an object reference, which again is an object references cannot be saved. So the way I'm planning on doing this, and I have not yet concluded if it's going to work, is I'm going to first spawn in every, um, every, every object that's in the save data, I spawn in. And after every uh, sp uh, object is spawned in, I'm going to go through the entire list of objects again. And then I'm going to see which uh, references are need to be found. So I, everything has a unique name. And then based on that unique name, I can restore the reference. And that's basically what I'm planning on doing. So the, the flow chart is basically like this. When the game is saved, find every single object that uh, is tagged as a game logic object. So game logic. So if I go to edit this, I go to my actor and my tags. Doors actually don't have it yet. Okay, well, that's good to know. Pawn. Actor. Tax, tax. Yeah, gameplay object. So get every, uh, ob every object with the tag gameplay object will get uh, deleted and then saved in the save data structs, but only if it has... Uh, is, is inherited by... Is an inheritance of ISK safe status interface. So when that is done, it will put everything in a file, which I've not yet done, but it will put everything in a file. And then when the game loads, it will first uh, go through the struct, spawn in every actor again, then go through every actor and see if there are references that need to be reconnected. And that's it. I think I'm done with that this week, hopefully. But yeah, it's that's it's it's an annoying process to do because it's not very interesting, but it needs to be done. Um, more C plus plus. Well, I just explained that. Animations, yeah. So I need to, like I said earlier, with I've I removed him from existence. Okay. Like I said earlier with the with the jumping animations, the reason why there are no jumping animations is because again, I said this last time as well, I'm gonna completely rework uh, third person animations. So there is there was no reason for me to quickly make a jumping animation for him. Because that's all going to be done in one time and I'm gonna just make it pretty much mostly procedural animation with uh, the help of keyframes instead of like pre-baked animation. That's going to be, I, I, I expect to be busy with it for, I'm hoping only two weeks. But the thing is, I'm, I don't think I can focus on one. The thing is, I can't, I can't really often focus on one thing at a time. The way I work efficiently is if I, uh, sometimes work on this, sometimes works on that, sometimes I work on that, and that's more efficient. But yeah, that's like a really big thing, do, redoing all the third-person animations with a completely new procedural system. But it's going to be worth it, totally. Because it's just going to look better. I'm, I'm currently replaying Halo on PC. 
and I'm absolutely making myself hate myself by playing on Legendary. But one thing I have noticed in even the first Halo is they actually have a lot of procedural animations and it's it's just so good. Like it it makes the game it, like even though that game is freaking old, procedural animations are just so much better than pre-baked and I feel really stupid for doing using pre-baked animations, but it's going to be good from now on. So better now than later. Which is technically something you can always say, but hey, whatever. Uh, is there anything else to talk about? Model improvements? Oh yeah. So, uh, I'm going to make a few model improvements, mostly for the demons. I don't want to call them demons because it's a bit of a generic term. I want to give them an actual name that I've not yet come up with anything. But anyway, the de as you can see, the demons have this uh, insanely a sharp angle on their legs and I already know that that's going to cause hell for the procedural animation so I'm gonna redo the leg model so this is a less sharp animation and I'm also gonna change the uh the feet hoofs because I made these hoofs like this because I thought it looked cool but uh it actually would make absolutely no sense from there's just too little artic art articulation in it, so it, it wouldn't make sense to for something to evolve to such a hoof. So I'm going to make something realistic that would look a lot better with uh, procedural animations. Same would be with the Minotaur. The Minotaur also has a very short, has the same problem, so I need to fix that. And another problem is that... Uh, I the the hooves should be smaller and should have an additional bone so it would move better. But uh, yeah. stuff that needs to be done. And also weapons. So right now I have a bunch of weapons that don't make sense. So the AR is oh, that's a bug. That would only that only happens in the developer map, but it's still bug. Uh, there are no there are no fire controls. There are like. There's, there's no bolt release, there's no magazine release, there's no bolt open, bolt hold open, etc. And there's also no fire selector, and that, that stuff I for, just forgot about, so I need to add that. There are a bunch of other weapons, I also want to do some small model improvements. <sighs> Creature sounds and voice work, yeah, so that's the last major thing I need to do next to animations, and that's giving all the creatures voice lines. So I'm just going to find some animal sounds, but the problem is I have not been able to find any good ones. So I might just have to actually buy a stock sound pack. Uh, whatever. Uh, as for voice work, I'm just going to do some voice work for the troopers myself. And then just use a phaser and radio static to hide my awful, awful voice acting. And then for Kira, I, I want Kira to actually have a voice, but... Uh, well, I'm not going to find a voice actor for her this month, especially since I'm still experimenting with a lot of stuff. So she's just going to be quiet for the demo. Okay, additional topics. University I talked about. Yeah, so the demo might be delayed because I... am Not because I miscalculated how much time I would need... The reason why the demo is delayed is because I just want to do more stuff. That's the whole thing. The scope of the demo is going to get bigger. And that's, I possibly have to delay the demo to, I don't know, September, October, whatever. Which, you know, that, that's just the thing. If, if, you improve, if you make the scope of your game bigger, you're going to have to spend more time on it. Which is, of course, a completely alien concept for AAA game companies. And their managers who keep <laughs> thinking that they can get a huge scope in a very little amount of time. Well, that doesn't work. And that is a lesson that's never going to be learned. Ain't that fucking right, CD Projekt Red? Oh my god. Quake rumor, last thing. Yeah, so this week, apparently, there is going to be a Quake reboot with a female protagonist, which is just hilarious. <laughs> I'm already nervous. I'm not sure how to feel about it. On one hand, it's going to be annoying because people are going to compare my game to that game. Because, I mean, obviously my game is Quake-inspired. I'm not going to say it's a Quake spiritual successor because it's it's obviously not. 
there is not none of that Lovecraftian stuff, which uh, maybe I'll. Nah, maybe. Um. So yeah, it could also be good because if the game flops, then it would be obviously <laughs> it would be pretty great for me if the the Quake game flops and uh, with how they have handled the Quake license within the last ten years, the the possibility is there, because the rumor is as well that they're going. It is it, not going. It tech is not going to make it. It's going to be fucking outsourced again. Quake is going to get outsourced again, which that that worked so well for Quake Champions. Uh, I don't know. I, I really don't know how to feel about the Quake rumor. But even outside of the fact that it's going to like compete with my game, I, I mean, obviously, if they're going to release their game in a year, I'm not going to release my game in the same year. <laughs> That's off the, off, the, out, off the table. I much prefer to just spend an extra year working on it than release my game at the same time as the new Quake. That's That's for sure. But like, I don't know how to feel about it, both from my perspective or from a personal perspective, because I do care about Quake. I, I really like Quake. I have not yet, I have, I have not really played the Quake games in any recent time. I've only played Quake 1 recently. The other Quake games I've pretty much forgotten about. I'm pretty sure I've never played 4. And I also know Quake fans are very 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 specific about what they like and what they don't like so it's going to be a tough order for whoever is going to make it yeah that's that's it uh fuck 